Buenos dias. Buenos dias. Uh, yesterday we did a morning hug, un abracito matutino, uh, which is a tradition within ICS Latin America. So I want to invite you to turn to the person next to you and you feel okay to give a hug, give a hug. If you feel like you're not ready, then do this and give a smile, okay? Let's do an abracito matutino. <laughs> Okay, okay, that was more than one. Uh, Eduardo Galeano, a known Latin American writer, once wrote the following from a conversation he had with a friend. She is in the horizon, I go two steps, and she moves two steps away. I walk 10 steps, and the horizon runs 10, 10 steps ahead. No matter how much I walk, I will never reach her. What good is utopia? That is what, it's good for walking. Ernesto Sabato, another Latin American Argentinian writer, starts one of his books, which is my favorite, with the following sentence. There are days when I wake up with a crazy hope, moments in which I feel that the possibilities of a more humane life at, are at our reach. Both of these 20th century writers were keen observers of Latin American's history of exploitation and suffering. They both express a desire for kingdom realities and hope. In Latin American evangelical theology, at least the one I've enjoyed and been challenged by and continue to learn from, has the kingdom of God at the center of the Christian experience and mission. And why not? It was the main teaching of Jesus in life and after the resurrection, it's in the whole Bible narrative, and it's what we await, isn't it? <coughs> this last morning, I want to explore three questions. When will the kingdom come? Whose is the kingdom? How do things work in the kingdom? And end with the fourth element, which is us in the kingdom. When, who's, how, us. I chose these four points because I think they help us continue exploring the kingdom of God. When will the kingdom come? When? And here comes what was read to us from Acts 1. And we should show some grace to the disciples because the Spirit of God has not descended yet upon them. So the disciples still don't get the full picture. After Jesus' resurrection, he spent 40 days appearing at different moments and teaching his followers about the kingdom. Before Jesus is taken into heaven, the disciples ask, Lord, are you, the, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus responds that the time of the kingdom is not their thing to know, but they will get the Holy Spirit and they will be witnesses to Christ to the ends of the earth. Brothers and sisters, again, there are things we do not get to know or control in terms of the kingdom of God. But in the power of the Spirit, we are made Christ's witnesses. And as an indirect answer, Jesus is saying, my kingdom comes as you go. My kingdom comes as you go. But let us pay attention as to how we go. And this is very important. I told you, I live in Tijuana, and many people come into my city on short-term mission trips, usually thinking that they will solve something that's broken there. Uh, they, they will provide for what's needed. I spoke about this at Urbana, actually. The problem is people coming and thinking they know, but not knowing anything about God's work in our city, our history, without not, not knowing local leadership. Many churches from the North come trusting that they have resources, that they have power, but they don't understand complex cultural relationships that are at play there. They don't know our history. They don't know the history of migrations. They don't know la our language. They don't know our hurts as, our, as a city, as a border city. 
So as the Spirit empowers us to go, following Jesus in his kingdom, again, we don't go in our power, in our resources, following the logic of worldly empires. We go in the ways of Jesus, in the power of the Holy Spirit, in humility, in vulnerability, and in interdependence. And as we go, we also trust that Jesus will return, as the angel said. We know and we hope Jesus will bring his kingdom fully, which is what we pray, right? We pray the kingdom come. We hope and live under that hope and reality of the kingdom to come. Next question, whose is the kingdom? And I will read from Matthew 19, verses 13 through 15. Then people brought little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked them. Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. When he had placed his hands on them, he went on from there. We know, we all know these, this passage, right? My five-year-old loves this story because I, often when I narrate that to her, I emphasize how Jesus rebuked the adult disciples, right? And how much Jesus wanted the little children to come to him. This story continues with the reversal of the kingdom of God. Little children in Jesus' time had no rights and were the most vulnerable, more so than today. But Jesus placed them at the center, focusing again who's on the margins. The kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these, Jesus declares. It's not to those who have a childish faith and like to tantrum. It's, I think, to those on the fringes, to those who can't offer much, who do not count for much in our society, and who hold a simple faith, a childlike faith. And this story in in Matthew is followed by another story, which is quite the opposite, actually. This is a man who probably was a religious scholar and questions Jesus and says, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? That is, what good do I need to enter the kingdom, right? But he has it all wrong, Jesus suggests. It's not about what we do to obtain the kingdom and eternal life. It's about what God has done in Christ. Then Jesus tells him several commandments he must follow. And the young man believes he's perfect in following those and kind of says, what else do you have for me, Jesus? And and then Jesus responds directly to his heart. If you want to be perfect, go, sell your possessions, and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven, then come follow me. This was not what the young man expected to hear. Not at all. The kingdom is for the poor in spirit, for those who mourn, for the meek, for those who hunger and thirst for justice, for the peacemakers and the ones who suffer persecution and oppression. The kingdom of God is close to the brokenhearted. This is the message we have in in the Bibles. And at this point, even the disciples are worried about who can enter the kingdom of God. But Jesus assures them, it's about who you trust. If you trust your power and your wealth, it's impossible. But if you trust God, there's every chance. We are all invited into the kingdom. We just need to recognize that we need all the help we can get from Jesus. How do things work in the kingdom? So I'll continue with stories. And I hope these stories fill our imaginations with the kingdom. The story, this this story is in Matthew 20. But it was actually when I heard it from my New Testament professor at Regent, Rick Watts, that it confronted me and changed my whole perspective on love and justice. I I will read it to you from the Message Bible version. But first, I want you to imagine with me that you are a farm worker or a day laborer and that you need to work every day in order to bring food to the table for your family, okay? You live, as they say, from hand to mouth and your work for the day pays for supper, which is your family's main meal. Just imagine with me that you have no savings and that you need to work in order to feed your family, but there's no certainty. 
Day laborers in the ancient world could be parallel to the experience of migrant workers in the US. They used, I used to see them a lot outside Home Depot. I don't know if this is, continues to happen. They're waiting sometimes all day to be hired for a day job. They were mostly Mexican and Central American workers, desperate day laborers. So here goes the story and listen carefully with this in mind. Jesus says, God's kingdom is like an estate manager who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. They agreed on a wage of a dollar a day and went to work. Later, about nine o'clock, the manager saw some other men hanging around the town square unemployed. He told them to go to work in his vineyard and he would pay them a fair wage. They went. He did the same thing at noon and again at three o'clock. At five o'clock, he went back and found still others standing around. He said, why are you standing around all day doing nothing? They said, because no one hired us. He told them to go to work in his vineyard. When the day's work was over, the owner of the vineyard instructed his foreman, call the workers in and pay them their wages. Start with the last hired and go on to the first. Those hired at five o'clock came up and were each given a dollar. When those who were hired first saw that, they assumed they would get much more, but they got the same, each of them one dollar. Taking the dollar, they groused angrily to the manager. These last workers put in only an easy hour and you just made them equal to us, who slaved all day under the scorching sun. He replied to the one speaking for the rest. Friend, I haven't been unfair. We agreed on the wage of a dollar, didn't we? So take it and go. I decided to give to the one who came last the same as you. Can't I do what I want with my own money? Are you going to get stingy because I am generous? As Jesus tells the story, we benefit from knowing the context, as that was what was in the minds of the people who were listening to Jesus. They knew the situation of day laborers. And we can see that as some, as, as some are taken to work at the vineyard, many are still waiting. As time goes by, hope diminishes. And we can imagine the workers' desperation. Supper seems improbable. Their children will go to bed hungry. But things work differently in the kingdom of God. People don't get what they deserve. They get what they need. In the kingdom of God, people do not get what they deserve. They get what they need. The economy of God's kingdom works differently, and it does not benefit those who have the most money and resources. The ways of the kingdom of God can only be followed as we walk in the ways of Jesus, as we observe him well, we listen to the stories, and we allow him to encounter us, to confront us, to challenge us with his extravagant love and reckless generosity. Us in the kingdom, us in the kingdom. We are not called to be judges. Messengers, yes. Witnesses, yes. Ambassadors, yes. Judges, no. That doesn't mean we don't announce that with the kingdom of God will come judgment. We do. But the ultimate judge is God and we trust that things will be put right. We trust that our wrongdoings won't be counted against us. And that, as we, and that is why we invite people to repent. As we do mission in the world, that is as we live under the reality of God's kingdom that has come through Jesus and continues to come and be present among us, we are messengers of the kingdom of God. But it's not only about what we say, we are to live into that hope and future because the way we live matters. The kingdom of God is not unethical because what we, we believe that God cares about the injustices of the world. We strive to live under the kingdom of God and we seek God's kingdom and, and its righteousness. We are to live under this kingdom reality because the kingdom is a reality in our world. And we see it as people reconcile to God, to one another, to creation. The verses chosen for this mission in Focus Week are 2 Corinthians 5 verses 8, 14 to 21. And they remind us that in Christ we are a new creation, that God is doing something new. 
We are the first fruits of his creation through God's word, says James. And as ambassadors in 2 Corinthians, we represent Christ and work in the ministry of reconciliation. We are symbols of the kingdom. That's a privilege, brothers and sisters. These days I've been trying to highlight that the mission of God, as it becomes clear in the Gospel of Mark, is the message of the, of the kingdom of God, the message of the gospel of the kingdom of God. The mission of God is the invitation to partner with what God is doing in bringing his kingdom, or in other words, reconciling the whole world to himself. Jesus Christ is the one who brings the kingdom, and he is the great reconciler. Jesus in life, death, and resurrection shows us what the kingdom is like and invites us to pray for the kingdom to come and also tells us that we ought to live as citizens of God's kingdom. This has ethical implications as to how we live. In Latin America, we care a lot about this, about not only speaking about the kingdom, but living the kingdom realities. In context of so much injustice and so much inequality, this is very important. John the Baptist is an example to us of a disciple because he struggles with the kingdom of God and in some ways he helps us articulate our own struggles. But he's not the only one who struggles, right? His disciples also did. And we struggle maybe when we become aware of how the kingdom of God puts us at odds with the world. The great reversal of the kingdom means that we do mission under a different logic. Our allegiances have to change. We can't no longer trust our family name, our resources, our money, our nationality. We need to shift our expectations and renew our imaginations with the kingdom of God in sight. As our allegiance to God and his kingdom is affirmed, as we experience the kingdom of God in unexpected ways in our path of obedience, we will almost always clash with worldly values and expectations because they threaten the status quo. The kingdom of God as we see it in Jesus' time is not what people expected, but it was good. It was about life, hope, and shalom. What does it mean to live as witnesses of Jesus and his kingdom to the ends of the earth? We are called to God's mission, and some of you are actually also being called to do God's mission abroad. My Mexican friends who are missionaries in the Middle East have shared with me that Western missionaries want to partner with them, and I celebrate that. But many of them are not willing to take risks to lower their missionary standards abroad and live in lower income housing, for example. And sometimes that makes it impossible for them to partner because of the imbalance of power and resources. Mission in the context of the kingdom of God challenges us because the kingdom of God is not limited by the economics of the empires and does not only benefit those who have a social security, right? How do we live under these realities of the kingdom here and now and wherever we go? And we don't have to figure it all right now. We're invited again to believe, repent, and to follow Jesus into his kingdom. Following Jesus, obeying his call into mission looks different for all of us. But as we follow and we're aware of this global calling as part of the global church, we can come humbly with the desire to be interdependent, trusting God, vulnerable, and aware of our own needs and privileges, open to relationships. And here's where I want to invite you to check out the tables in the lower beamer area, I think that's how it's called, um, and go speak with the different people and missionary agencies. There you can also find a table uh, with more of the work I do with students around the world at the InterVarsity link table. Um, and it's just an opportunity for you to have those conversations to explore options. Because the kingdom of God advances in the context of relationships. We see it when life is preserved over rules and regulations. We can see God's kingdom at work when love wins over hate. And Jesus invited the disciples, if you remember, to follow him into the relationships he was developing. He developed the people he was encountering, the things he was teaching, the healings, the restoration, all the love he was showing, and also the denunciation of those who exploited and used people. Jesus, we see, had little patience for those who think they had it all together. 
but enter the homes of people like Zacchaeus, who didn't mind climbing a tree just to meet Jesus. So let the stories of the gospel fill your imaginations again with the kingdom of God and get close to the margins. Be willing to go as you are sent by the Holy Spirit. May your eyes be open to see the kingdom and who is less expected and where you least expected. And may you do God's mission in the way of Jesus by loving others deeply, entering into the complex uh, web of human relationships. My prayer is that we can be open to this kingdom even if it comes to us in unexpected ways. May we live missionally, working for God's shalom, the flourishing of all, because this is what God's kingdom is about. And as a way of sending, I want to do something a bit different and pray over you. A portion of a poem from Wendell Berry, who is like an American prophet. And this portion starts with this. So friends, every day do something that won't compute. Love the Lord, love the world, work for nothing. Take all that you have and be poor. Love someone who does not, do, who does not deserve it. Denounce the government and embrace the flag. Hope to live in that free republic for which it stands. Give your approval to all that you cannot understand. Praise ignorance for what man has not encountered, he has not destroyed. Ask the questions that no, have no answers. Invest in the millennium. Plant sequoias. Say that your main crop is a forest that you did not plant, that you will not live to harvest. Say that the leaves are harvested when they have rotten in, into the mold. Call that profit. Prophesy, prophesy such returns. Put your faith in the two inches of hummus that will build under the trees every thousand years. Listen to carrion. Put your ear close and hear the faint chattering of the songs that are to come. Expect the end of the world. Laugh, laughter is unmeasurable. Be joyful though you have considered all the facts. So long as a woman, so long as women do not go cheap for power, please women more than men. Ask yourself, will this satisfy a woman satisfied to bear a child? Will this disturb the sleep of a woman near to giving birth? Go with your love to the fields, lie easy in the shade, rest your head in her lap, swear allegiance to what is nightest of your thoughts. As soon as the generals and the politicals can predict the motions of your mind, lose it. Leave it as a sign to mark the false trail, the way you didn't go. Be like the fox who makes more tracks than necessary, some in the wrong direction. Practice resurrection. May it be so.